Huh. Patreon reformatted. I don't know how I feel about how they reformatted. They reformatted their website? The Yeah. Some of the tables on it are no longer uh, a bunch of... Co oh, I just needed to make my screen wider. I'd accidentally switched to the mobile layout. Okay. I feel better now. Oh, okay. Okay. The difference between uh, mobile and not mobile is, is profound. As it should be. So in theory, we're live. In theory, people are saying hi to us. Um, hi, now's your chance. Humans. Everybody say hi. I'm, I'm like slightly distracted. I've been stuck in technical support with my phone company for the last two hours now. <sighs> So you're hoping to record without them actually coming back from putting you on hold? Well, no, it's it's we're doing it in chat. Okay. And so, you know, every now and then people who are who are watching the show may notice my uh my attention shift for a second and my and hear a little pop and that's just my <laughs> browser registering their latest inability to solve the problem. So sad. So sad. Yeah. No, they, no service. They totally broke my phone. Okay, great. This is fun. Oh. <laughs> There's a pop. There, you, you, do, you won't hear it, but the people watching will hear it. Anyway, so let's say hello to Adam Synergy, Andrew Planet, Andy Cowley, Astro YYZ, Ben Kalo, Cherry, Christopher Senti, Colin Jones, Dustin Haskins, Eric Knapp, Frank Tippin, Giselle Sabrin, Gordon Dewis, Grain W, Guido Bibra, Harry M, Ian Farkron, John Seffel, Johnny Z, Kylie Serna, Luke Duke, Magnus Timer Jensen, Maria Kobitz, Mrs. Nat, Nancy Graziano, Noel Ruppenthal, Ocean McIntyre, Rich Wilson, R. Jones, Sargusi, Thomas Tranaker, TJ Lipinski, and Wayne Johnson. Hey, everybody. This is great. I, I see a bunch of names there who we don't, who we don't often get a chance to see, so... Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what it is that you have stumbled into, you are about to watch us record a live episode of Astronomy Cast while Fraser also attempts to <laughs> navigate phone technical support with, uh, was it work? Did it work? It didn't work. Did they fix your phone? Did they fix my phone. Wait, come on, come on, wait for it, wait for it. No, they didn't fix it. The anyway, um, so we're going to do an episode about uh, about comets. Are you uh, are you all ready? I, I believe so. Yeah. I so don't worry to... if you hear that plop noise. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it won't be recorded in the actual episode. It will, so you'll every now and then hear it go pop. Uh, and it's either that or just like there it goes pop. Okay. All right. Um, let me know when you're ready to start recording. I I have pressed record and I am recording. I am also recording. All right. Here we go. I hope this is the right number. Astronomy Cast, episode 566, When Comets Fall Apart. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Spring keeps playing with our minds here. It is glorious and fully flowered and like six degrees Celsius. Oh, really? It's, oh. it's like... 40-ish out. It's, it's supposed to get below freezing tonight. I am bitter. Our apple tree is in full-on bloom, and there are no bees. Yeah, we have it tons of bees. Okay. Do, do you have, um, do you get the uh, mason bees? Yes. Yeah, so we have, we have yes. little mason bee houses that we, uh, that we keep in the garage every wintertime, and then in the, in the springtime, unless we forget, and then we have a garage full of bees, but we in the springtime take the mason bee houses out and put them in the in the various places in the orchard, and then the the bees will come out and do their thing, and it's so cool. They're so that, great. 
yeah our our mason bees just keep finding things to put yeah. holes into oh, yeah it's, yeah it's what they do yeah no question we all we have the exact same situation which is that we have we have uh, we have the bees who follow our rules and they go to bed every year in the in the garage and then we have the ones that that decide that anything that is like a the right shaped hole <laughs> needs to be filled with bee larva and so you find them popping out of popping out of parts of the house and all kinds of stuff but they're so great they're they're the first bee to come out and there's and it's just a pleasure to see them just going crazy and we're always so worried when that that we're not going to have enough flowers to to feed them in the beginning all right um and there you go there's 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 our happy apocalypse uh update as everyone <laughs> knows the universe owes us a bright comet there have been a lot of promising candidates but in the end they always fail to live up to our expectations comets keep on breaking up with us it's true it's true um so did you get to see hail bop when it oh yeah out? Oh yeah, yeah, and this like this is the thing is that I talk to I talk to the children these days, the kids these days, people who are <laughs> you know younger than thirty, right, who don't remember what it's like yeah. to have a bright comet in the sky. There is nothing like it, and and we need this to happen again. But as near as I can tell. <sighs> comets are much more interested in breaking our hearts than fulfilling our dreams yeah yeah and so it's like northern lights yeah total solar eclipse yes incredible meteor shower yes. and bright comet those i've seen two out of four i've seen oh yeah <laughs> so so those are those are like that's the i don't know the hat trick whatever you make with a four a four <laughs> four hats quad that's the that's the quad dumbret of of astronomical experiences is to get those four incredibly bright objects to see them all in your lifetime and and normally you will see them on a regular basis right if you're organized and you're willing to travel a little bit you can see them all but the one that you can't guarantee that you're going to see is that comet comets show up on their own you know they're and the wizards of they're the they're the wizards of astronomy astronomical events and and there are ways that they break up that are fine <laughs> so the great breakup that we experienced was of course shoemaker levy nine <laughs> this was a massive comet that never promised us a pretty bright star in this bright comet in the sky and instead it put on an amazing splatter show on the planet jupiter yeah so so let's talk a little bit about this like like what causes a comet to break up so there there are a couple of factors i first of all comets are made of not the most um stable substance they are a mix of ices water ice carbon dioxide uh all these different gases nitrogen that have gone into their solidish form and i say ish because it doesn't take a whole lot of energy to transform these i ices back into gases and when this happens they greatly expand in size and so the i mean just to be clear about this right that the that the interior of the comet is not a f complete frozen ball of of ice in a sphere it is just a loose collection of rock and gas and dust and all kinds of stuff and that when it warms yeah. up then they start to these gases start to sublimate out of them and and this is where the dust and gravel that's mixed in as well along with some organic materials becomes important because when that gas sublimates all of those other materials get shot off the surface and form this coma of various materials that reflect the sunlight back to us allowing us to see them so we are able to see comets as these bright, gorgeous comas and tails because they are unstable, 
unstable bowls of ice mm. that is lumpy and bumpy and sometimes even rubber duck shaped. Right. And so the 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 spraying off of the material, this is their feature. This is what you want. A good comet is one that is going to to blast off all of this material into space, but not too much. Right. And and this this becomes our problem is they are very loosely held together by a touch of, ga of gravity, a touch of chemistry. And when those physical bonds, I'm going to start that sentence over. And when those physical bonds aren't strong enough and that gravity is too weak, the comet can blast itself apart or even get shredded by gravity. Right, right. Okay, so we so we know sort of why comet. I mean, comets are are really just a rough amalgamation of stuff. They're just can't wait to fall apart um, anyway. So that's why they fall apart. But what are the specific kinds of events that will cause them to be more likely to fall apart? So, so the two big comet killers are gravity and heat. So with our good old friend Shoemaker Levy 9, when it got too close to Jupiter, tidal forces, the differences in gravity between the near side and the far side of the comet were enough to pull that comet into a series of chunks that on its next orbit, well, plunked straight on into Jupiter and did a glorious job keeping all of us deeply involved during the, I believe that was the summer of 94. Yes. And, and that was awesome. More of that, please. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I mean, we don't get to really appreciate, but we get to see the effect of, of all of these chunks smashing into uh, a, a Jupiter. And I guess that's fine. But it, it, it is very fine. It, don't forget, it wasn't just that they smashed in and created those black splooches that we saw. Yeah. They also created giant fireballs that extended out from the edge of Jupiter's surface. It was kind of awesome. Well, and we learned a tremendous amount about, about the upper layers of Jupiter by gouging out all this material. I mean, it was a scientific boon, the likes of which planetary scientists had never even known they could have hoped for right well how exactly. else are you going to be able to to throw yes. a, a a i don't know a city sized chunk of material into jupiter and see the effect only when space is willing to pull this off for you and we think and by this i mean there are a few random researchers out there and this is highly controversial but sometimes you have to just like the controversial story there are a few astronomers out there that think that comet enki may have actually uh, gotten pulled apart into multiple pieces through close uh, gravitational passes with our own planet earth and there are a few hints that maybe there was even some impacts with some of those pieces so it doesn't take a giant planet to tear apart a comet that comet just has to get well a little too close and have a really rough day so in these cases you have an object that's slightly active and um, then gravity just tears it apart and you end up with chunks o comet and we had a few really promising candidates in the last couple of years remember comet ison that was going to be next. Yeah. So Thanksgiving Day 2013? Oh, yeah. It was, I remember it was like after we started doing our shows on Google+. Plus. Yeah. Um, so this was early in the days of Google Hangouts. Yeah. So it's got to be, it was early 2013. It was 2012 or 2013. Yeah, 2012, 2013. And, and Comet Ison was going to be the one. It was, it was on the right trajectory that was going to take it really close to the sun. We were going to see, finally, that bright comet. What happened? And, and on Thanksgiving Day, it passed behind the sun relative to us. So we couldn't watch it in the moment. But it was a fairly close pass. It didn't spend very long behind the sun. It went in glorious, and it came out a cloud of dust. Did it even... I remember it like... It was like 
astronomers were watching the other side, like the, because it, it, that's exactly right. I mean, for you to get a nice bright comet, it has to go close to the sun to expand out and it has to come close to the earth so we can see it. We knew the trajectory was going to bring it close to the earth. And I remember the uh, astronomers watched it go in behind the sun and then they were waiting and they were yeah. waiting and then they're like, okay, and where to go? I remember noisy astronomer was over at our house for Thanksgiving and Nicole Gallucci. And, uh, we, we were constantly updating Twitter, trying to find out what happened. We were ready with you to jump on hangouts yep. if there were cool images coming out. And instead, there was only sadness. Yeah, I think because... if I recall, and again, this is, you know, this was eight years ago or whatever. There was nothing like it just it didn't come out the other side from the sun. And and there was a little bit of controversy about this because. There certainly was not a comet that came out the other side, but there were observations where the timing was wrong unless it was something that simply had its orbit radically changed. Right. There was essentially a debris cloud right. that came out the other side. Yeah. And there were a few moments of wishful hopefulness of maybe there are some chunks still in that debris cloud that'll be big enough to give us a comet. And no. There were no chunks in the debris cloud. It was the comet that died on yeah. Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving yeah. Day. Instantly. Just yeah. gone, vaporized. And so it, it tore itself apart, yeah. and then the pieces were vaporized, and the comet was gone. And, and one of the unfortunate parts about this is as they recreated what had to have happened, it was figured out that it was probably a couple of hours before its absolute closest approach that it got torn apart. And so as it went through its closest approach, all the pieces were already broken up, giving them a lot more surface area to get blasted by the sun, just destroying whatever was left. Right, right. So, so we've seen an example then of you know, we talked about Comet Enki. We talked about Comet Ison. Do you remember McNaught? That was our next great hope. That that was, and and I remember like going outside when when it was first uh, started to brighten up. You could see it as a daytime object, but not as a nighttime object. So a whole bunch of us were going outside and trying to figure out how to see it during the daytime, but it was just. It was about as easy to see as Venus is during the day, which means it's really hard. I never succeeded. I don't know if no. you ever succeeded. Well, so the, so the problem we had, right, was that it was when it was reasonably visible from Earth, it was only visible if it was passing through the Southern Hemisphere. And so a lot of our Southern Hemisphere friends were getting great pictures of it. And they're yes. like, yep, this is it. This is on track. This is going to be our comet. Um, and then as it was starting to make that transition from a Southern Hemisphere comet to a Northern Hemisphere comet, it went poof. Yeah. <laughs> and for the people who are listening, that's me making a sort of a, a puff explosion sound as the comet just turned from a fairly compact, really cool object into this giant. And it ended up being just this enormous one, just this, this absolutely enormous object, but very diffuse definitely not visible from the from the so the our our australian and african colleagues yeah. have these amazing long tailed it had this weird stuttering tail yeah uh images super close to the landscape because it was so low in the sky these these are some of my absolute favorite comet images they're they're often taken in twilight we got nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the Southern Hem and the, so the Southern Hemisphere were like literally in the moment they're like, okay, well, they're handing the camera off to us, right? They're handing the telescope from the North, the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. We just get a gigantic diffuse puffball because the comet tore itself into pieces. And, and this year too. <sighs> literally just days ago. Just days ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was Atlas. Comet Atlas. Comet Atlas. Comet Atlas was predicted to be at its brightness somewhere between second magnitude, which is about where Betelgeuse got at its dimmest, um, to minus six, which is like 
you contemplate, can you read by the comet? That's how bright minus six is. <laughs> now, it wasn't going to all be the brightness tight in one place. So it wasn't going to be like a fireball in the sky. It's going to be spread over the whole size of that comet. But that's still amazing. Yeah. And and it was getting brighter and brighter. And it was the end of this month. It was supposed to hit its brightness. And then it went from being a nice tight little nucleus with a pretty little coma and a well-formed tail to being at least three pieces, three separately observable pieces yep. that are separating in distance that just within days after the episode were spread out by uh, almost 2,000 and 4,000 kilometers. And thanks, uh, <laughs> sorry, Atlas, uh, fail. Uh, but you know what? We, we keep going. Um, now, did you trace what happened with are even interstellar comets seem to have gone through this as well. Yes. So Comet Borisov, and this one's a bit tragic because poor Comet Borisov, here's an object that formed in another solar system that underwent some sort of a gravitational interaction that flung it out of its home, sent it our way. And as it goes on its touristic journey through our solar system, the sun is like, and you're done. Yep. just broke it up yeah and broke just it up broke it and up. and i mean i think the, the thing that's so funny is that this is i mean the fact that that comet borisov while while comet um uh Oumuamua was so weird although yes. now it looks like we might be able to explain it with the same thing but yes. borisov was just like was behaving precisely like a comet at every step exactly. it was exactly and then of course obviously ex, you know breaks apart and forms a just like a comet ought to Borisov and, and it's <laughs> it's just sad I mean this this thing existed for we don't know how long it traveled what tens of light years hundreds of light years maybe thousands of light years to get to our solar system and and then we just destroy it yeah this is why we can't have nice things right yep absolutely uh, and so then um, we've got uh, Oumuamua, you know, and one of the things that, that have been really puzzling astronomers is like, how could you have this this object that was 10 times longer than it was wide, that it was like a spinning cylinder or a pencil, you know, like super weird. Right. But if you, but astronomers just recently calculated, in fact, if you look at it as a collection of broken up particles spinning yeah. around a common center of uh, axis of rotation, totally explains what you're seeing here. And, and this is one of those cases that it, it wasn't made of comet stuff alone. Uh, we're learning over time more and more that asteroids and comets is a transition where you go from things that are mostly rock, but you've still got some ices in there. You never seem to ever completely escape ices. And then you have objects that are mostly ice with that handful of dust and gravel mixed in. Well, with a Muamua, there was probably an object that was more on the rocky side than the icy side. But as it passed on a comet-like orbit near its host star, or it was a truly huge comet. We can't know which. Um, whatever its original status was, as it passed near its home star, it got disrupted. And that disruption caused it to be a whole bunch of different pieces that each had slightly different velocities. And so they stretched out into this long column, cigar, call it what you will, finger of collected stuff right now any volatiles that were in this probably got baked out but this now column of stuff was gravitationally kind of drawn back together and essentially cold welded into a new object yeah. now we don't know if this is more rubble pile like Bennu or Ryugu or if because this was a disrupted 
cloud of debris if if it was molten enough to form a more of a solid object. Right. We don't know the heating mechanism that went into it, but whatever it was, but you it, had to destroy something to get to a muamua. And again, so I, I you know, we, we started this conversation talking about what happened with Comet Shoemaker Levy Nine. That you started with this this solid comet. It went past Jupiter. It got the gravity of Jupiter tore it into this string. It came back around for another run, and then it crashed into Jupiter. But what if instead of you know flew past Jupiter or flew past the Sun, was torn into this string of material, but then was kicked out of the entire solar system and then flew through the cosmos for a hundred million years, whatever, some enormous amount of time, and that all of those objects slowly collected back together into, uh, as you say, you know, the cold welded just one on top of the other. That seems to explain the behavior and the, the what this thing looked like, which is, again, just an absolutely fascinating idea. It's so exciting to, you know, and, more exciting the, to me. Okay, fine. An alien spacecraft is more exciting. <laughs> but when I think about legitimate... It was not a rendezvous with Rama. Right. But when you think about legitimate <laughs> answers for what Oumuamua was, that one is very exciting to me. And I just love the dynamical differences that you can run into. Because if something is on a fairly lazy orbit, elliptical in towards the sun, it lingers too long and the pieces get shredded too much, dissipated too much, you end up with Ison. But if you have something that's on a super fast orbit that's actually in the process of flinging it out of a solar system, that parabolic, hyperbolic orbit, then that crossing time is so fast that it gets torn apart, but the pieces don't get too far apart to not gravitationally still cling on to one another. So it's the fact that these pieces still clung together that tells us this happened during one really zippy approach near whatever yeah. it is that tore it apart. So what does this tell us? Do you think in general? I mean, if if I mean, if we what did we mark off? There's like five or six objects, all of which were going to be a return to Hayakutake or Hale Bop, and instead we just got debris blown in our general direction. What um, it tells me is the one good thing Generation X got was a cool comet in our 20s. In your face, millennials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only yeah, good yeah, thing Gen yeah, X got. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, boomers. Um, so, right. And so... But I mean, just like as we watch, as we, you know, as astronomers are watching the skies, looking and hoping for the next really bright comet that we could yeah. see, we should be mentally, emotionally prepared for, for constant it. Yeah. disappointment. Don't it's... think that it's that you're going to get the, the comet that you think you deserve. Comets are extraordinarily fragile. That's, that's one of the lessons. And those that aren't too fragile don't tend to get awesome tails. They don't tend to get awesome comas. It takes that heat to make them glorious. I, I, so I was going to say a lot I, of I, sadness. I always find it so funny though, right? Because we're already off. We're already onto the new hotness. So um, we've got uh, a new comet that looks like it's going to be the one that's going to to the swan yeah swan comet swan so we've got an article on on universe today uh just just about that dave dickinson is is working on that um yeah so like you know uh comet atlas who no it's time for <laughs> swan <laughs> right it is true yeah it is true which i think is just oh wow. which i think is just great because we just so quickly forget that last the universe know. is Linus. We're Charlie Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and comets are footballs. Yeah. So stay tuned. Maybe uh, Swan is going to be the one. Anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Pamela, uh, do you have some names for us this week? I do. As as always, I just want to say thank you to all the patrons out there that are supporting us. And I also want to say, I know a lot of you are really struggling right now. I see it reflected in... Um, we lost a whole lot of patrons since 
um, COVID started. We see you. We understand. We're here for you. Don't worry about it. Join our communities, play a game of Ticket to Ride, and know you're not alone in the yeah. world. And know that you don't, you know, that, that supporting the work that we do is purely optional. And if, yeah. and if financial hardship is difficult for you in any, t in any way, shape, or form, don't stretch yourself to contribute to us. You know, and, just... and really, if you need some place to just go and find other humans... The Weekly Space Hangout crew has you. Yeah. Join us and we'll get through all of this together. It's what we have always done. You guys have carried us for so many years. And the least we can do is say, come, let's just get through this socially staying close through the internet. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, we don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. But like we only had 14 cases in British Columbia yesterday. Wow. So we're down to a handful and we're now talking about reopening our economy, starting to, to stage in the different kinds of, of, uh, you know, businesses opening up again, restaurants being able to open, but with new measures put in place, if that works and we don't see the cases rise, like, like we're all at different stages of this crisis. Yeah. And, and you, hopefully as you see people, you know, as some of us, are able to reach the other side of it, we will extend lifelines and emotional support to help and give and show you that the work you're doing to stay home and socially distance, there is a light on the other end of this tunnel and it's going to be yeah. okay. We've just got to get through it. And, and the whole world has to do this together. So, so now more than ever, reach out, find community, con connect and, and you don't need to support us financially. And we're here to support you um, yeah. emotionally. So, but, but there are some names. There are some names. So I want to thank William Andrews, Jack, Mark Grundy, William Lauer, Jeremy Kerwin, Bruno Letts, Michelle Cullen, Jay Alex Anderson, Dustin A. Rolf, Joe Wilkinson, Marco LaRossi, Mark Stephen Raznak, Brian Kelby, and Jessica Feltz. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Pamela, we'll see you next week. See you next week. All right. Stop and don't go anywhere. We're just saving. <laughs> That's awesome. Unc Willie just put a little save icon in the uh in the zoo in the um in the Slack chat. That is so great. <laughs> That's awesome. And now we save. Okay, we save. We're safe. But for how long? <laughs> I uh, don't know. Um Arjone asks, how would a comet be kicked out of the solar system? What gave it the energy to actually leave rather than just be on a long orbit? It would have been some sort of a three-body interaction. So out in the outskirts of the solar system, three different objects come together and the energy from two of the objects gets transferred to the third and kicks it out. Yeah. And depending on the direction it kicks it out, it can um, essentially get, you can actually get a gravitational assist from a star if you're on an orbit around the center of the yeah. galaxy instead of through the solar system. So you have that three body interaction that puts it on an escape velocity, gets an added bump from its passage past the star, and there you go, yeah. escapee on its way. And the key is that comet, so so when you sort of measure the, the closer you get to the sun, the closer, if you're in orbit around the sun, you need greater and greater escape velocity to be able to get away from it. So here around Earth, it's like 42 kilometers per second is the change in velocity that you require from this location. Now, if you are already on going around the Earth, you're already getting 30 kilometers per second. So you only need an additional 13 kilometers per second of velocity to escape the solar system that's an enormous that's a tremendous amount of velocity yeah. but when you look at a comet that's in the outer the outer outer reaches of the solar system it essentially is 
just at the very edge of escaping already as it comes in on its big long journey down into the solar system and then goes back out. You know, when you kind of imagine it's on a roller coaster and it just reaches the very tippy tippy top. And if it had any additional velocity, it would be off into the into the rest of the galaxy. And it's those comets, and right? And so they're the ones. They fly into the solar system. They do. They pass by the sun. They make a slight pass past Jupiter. Boom! They've got enough velocity to leave the solar system entirely. And and one of the things that I didn't think through enough growing up is we've known for ages and ages that comets are quite often on hyperbolic or parabolic orbits. We see these single things come in. We look at their trajectories, and we now. That's it for this one. <laughs> yeah. She's gone. Goodbye. Now, if our galaxy, or not our galaxy, if our solar system is constantly shedding comets, that means, in theory, that other solar systems should also be constantly shedding yeah. comets. And so it shouldn't have surprised anyone when we finally started detecting them. It it did because apparently none of us failed to think through just how comet, common yeah. comets from other solar systems should be. And it, it is a tribute to the like how good the comet asteroid detection systems are today that we yeah. are finding more of this kind of thing. Like we went forever not knowing about interstellar comets and now we know of two. Exactly. And and just anticipate finding out more. Um, and that's and, and that is a result of the technology developed to protect us from asteroid impacts, which is a it, nice side benefit is, yeah, you know, we get it's, to stay safe. A, I, I forget who I was talking to, but we keep saying that we live in the golden age of astronomy. No, we live in the platinum era at this point. It's time to upgrade your metals, people. It's time to upgrade. Right. I mean, there's still a bunch of metal between here and I don't know, plutonium. Like we got lots more to go. Yes. Einsteinium. Right. <laughs> you know, shortly we'll be in the in the molybdenum age of or the uh, no the, the <laughs> biz, bismuth stage of. I'm trying to think what what comes after. We got platinum, palladium next, maybe. That works. I like palladium. Sure. Soon we'll be in the palladium. But yeah, we absolutely are. We're in the platinum age of, of, uh, of, of astronomy. I believe that's me. I believe I won't shut up about how this is the best time. Uh, Nancy asks, has anyone hypothesized that dark matter may be responsible for comets being ejected either permanently or into elliptical hyperbolic trajectories? I, it's density doesn't work that way. Um, so you essentially need one Acme bricks worth of dark matter per solar system blob volume of space to explain all of dark matter. And one Acme brick verse worth of material just isn't sufficient to change anything's orbit on that small a scale. Right. But the, but the point being like if you had a cloud of if you had 10 times the mass of the milky way in comets surrounding the milky way oh sorry i heard it the wrong direction um so the question becomes could comets be dark matter right um there what we're able to see when we start doing gravitational lensing micro lensing experiments um the way that uh, the dark matter shifts and moves when two galaxies slam into each other and two galaxy clusters slam into each other tells us that whatever dark matter is made of is a non-collisional particle. Right. So since comets do smash into each other quite happily yeah. um, and dark matter is made up of particles and we can even start to figure out what size those particles must be limited within as we look at yeah. this this data it's now it's but but you're dark you're gonna matter get, is non-baryotic stuff i mean we've talked about dust and how nasty yeah. dust is imagine 10 times the mass of the milky way is just comets like yeah you would see that so at this point yes. astronomers have literally ruled out every kind of mass except for black holes 
<laughs> right and, and even even, even the, that we've largely yeah. outruled with yeah. the macho and ogle projects yeah and so you sort of got the situation where the only thing that could be massive but not visible is black holes and they've been able to rule that out and so we're just yes. down to some kind of completely invisible particle in the electromagnetic spectrum yes. but it still influences us through gravity so it's not it's not dust it's not debris it's not comets it's not planets it's not brown dwarfs it's not black holes it's <sighs> something non-baryonic non-baryonic um unc willie asks do torn up comets explain the line of craters that appear to be the same age on the moon and other bodies oh good in question. some cases yeah yeah we should have covered yeah. that oh great question unc willie you're yeah right. um so if you have um, a bunch of broken up objects, they will slam into each other and make what's called a crater chain. Now, the majority of those crater chains that we see are actually due to secondary impacts. This is where you have your primary impactor come in, hit the surface, and then spray up material that is often still in the process of falling apart. And it's that sprayed up material quite often that creates those crater chains. But yes, you do end up, and we have these on Earth. There's a few double impact sites mm -hmm. on Earth that are considered to probably be some object that fell apart in the process of attack. Yeah, and so you, you can imagine they make a close, the close flyby of Earth, they get torn apart into a string of, of debris. Next time around, they smash into the moon and it's just like, like, like a machine gun spray yeah. boom 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 in this in this line of craters and we see enough of them to to know that that's a thing that happens incredible it's, it's kind of awesome yeah um uh wayne johnson asks do comets ever oh no sorry uh, this comes from Marjone. do comets ever fall to the yarkovsky effect and spin themselves apart they spend so much time in deep space i don't know yeah I don't know if we have enough data on any object. Um, now, the Yurkovsky effect is going to be much less because they experience less light pressure out at that distance. Um, yeah, I don't know if the almighty Yorp can destroy a comet. Um, and that was also, uh, oh, Gordon, okay. Um... Arjun's got a million questions, so if the rest of you don't jump in there, we'll just take a zillion <laughs> Arjun questions. Um, so uh, if a star were to pass within two light years of our solar system, would we see a ton of comets? I don't know if two light years is close enough. I'd have to do some calculations. Um, I know half a light year is close enough. I don't know about two light years. Yeah. Sorry. Um, we know that... Thanks to the Gaia data, we know that other stars are passing incredibly close to to us all the time. Yeah. Within, in some cases, uh, like half a light year. I'm trying to yeah. remember seventy thousand. I'm trying to remember the number. Anyway, we've I've, we've done some stories on this. Just you know, every few tens of thousands of years, another star comes close enough to kick comets but but it's not like the sky would be filled with comets no that that would be cool but no <laughs> it's scary um, but yeah <laughs> it would be awesome if we had two naked eye massive comets simultaneously but i'm not sure i would want to deal with all of the crank emails that i'd get yeah and and i mean there is there's the darker side to Comet Hale-Bopp, the, the fact that there was a um, religious cult mm -hmm. that committed suicide because they believed that they would be able to fly away on the spacecraft hidden in the comet that all that happened was a bunch of good people died. Yeah, yeah, which shows you the, you know, the downside of, of cults. Yeah. Uh, one of the many downsides yeah. of, of cults. And and a lack of appreciation for science. Yes. So, yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. We but, need more of that. So you, but it's but it's like instead of seeing a bright comet every and and the delay, of course, it, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of years, tens of thousands of years for the comet to make its journey down <clears throat> into the inner solar system from mm -hmm. far out. So you might a star might pass, and then m millennia later, the comets start arriving. And you're adding energy into the solar system that is going to fling things out just as much as it flings things in. So each of these encounters leaves us a little bit more empty. Right. But we also are, you know, have the potential to capture their comets. So, it's true. you know, what's happening to us is happening to them too. Re reciprocity. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, Ron Hook, astronomers have been detecting exoplanets for years with greater detail. Will we ever be able to detect exocomets? We already have, not oh. individually, but we've seen the Oort clouds and Kuiper belts of other solar systems. Yeah. So in, in, on mass. Yeah. The Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA, yes, just yes. Uh, ben Kalo is asking, what happened just before the moon locked to the Earth? Did its rotation period gradually slow to a stop? Or on its last day, did it almost make it around and then reverse direction and then oscillate back and forth for a few thousand years until it ran out of angular momentum? Um, I don't think angular momentum would allow it to oscillate. I'm pretty sure it just slowly stopped. Right. Um, so it's not like it, the, it went this way and then it turned back. No, that would just... take extra energy. Right. But what's cool is the Earth has also been getting slowed down. And there's fossil records of clamshells that were recently used to figure out what the length of the Earth day was, I forget how many years ago. We, we covered it in Daily Space. I'm not remembering any of the details. Yeah. But we have an article somewhere on dailyspace.org about this. Right. The thing that's pretty fascinating is, from what I understand, um, the process of the moon moving away from the Earth and the Earth changing its rotation rate actually mm -hmm. happened very quickly. Yes. So we imagine it as this very smooth line from from when the moon formed to when the moon locked to the earth as this sort of like, you know, it started one way and slowly if you just but in fact, it was very quickly, the moon moved yeah. out to a far distance, and then and stopped spinning. Yeah. And and then sl has been slowly drifting away ever since as the earth is rotation is slowing down. So it's so it's a little counterintuitive to what you would think for how quickly that whole process happened. There was uh, actually a, a sci-fi show that happened. I don't know if you watched that sci-fi show where they're back in the, they built a time machine. They're back in the dinosaur age and they were like building a you know dinosaurs were. Oh, was this the one when we were like five years old? No, no, no. This was like maybe eight years ago. Like no, I missed that one. It was like the main bad guy from um, Avatar was the main character in this show someone in some in the chat i'm sure will say but okay but and then so they they and so they were like whoa look how big the moon looks but actually the moon wouldn't look that much different <laughs> right um, oh well okay well, hey do i got a non uh comic question John okay Suffield asks if aliens landed in the usa and said that immortal line take me to your leader would you I guess we can't we can't uh, begin a political uh, conversation. So so what do you think? But do you think that just in general, if aliens land anywhere on Earth and mm -hmm. and said, you know, take me to your leader, would you feel like taking opening up correspondence with the political establishment in your country, the government? Yeah. makes more sense than take me to your scientists. Like, would you, would you bring, um, so you if you took the alien to the scientists, the military would promptly lock up the scientists and the alien. <laughs> so let's say you make it a way that it, you take it to the scientists and there's no way to cover it up. Right. Right. And, and so 
this is where if you can do it completely open access and make it a conversation among equals where they aren't capturing us, we aren't capturing them, and the military isn't capturing all of us. Yeah. Um, I think that's how I'd want to do it is the welcome I'm going to call together, not just the scientists, but also the philosophers, the, uh, the great thinkers, because... I mean, scientists make mistakes all the time because our curiosity carries us ahead of our morality. And Mm -hmm. Descartes said that's the root of all sin. And I don't know if sin's the right word, but you sure do F things up when you act without full understanding. I mean, have you seen Arrival? The movie Arrival? Yes, or, the, the foreign language one. That one's a beautiful Yeah, beautiful movie. One. And and you have this situation where these these spaceships appear across different places across the entire world. Yeah. And it really requires the coordination of the entire planet to be able to open up communication with, with the aliens for this very important reason. Yes. And it almost leads to war. Um, but in the end... Uh, it's about collaboration and and we're seeing that just with this coronavirus right now that and we're also seeing on the other side speaking as an american what happens when you look to see who do you blame instead of who do you help yeah yeah and and so the virus will exploit every single weakness in our yeah. health systems in our political systems and in our educational systems and in just in our level of trust with each mm-hmm. other and the government and and literally if we could all get along and act together as an entire world we could have this virus licked in two weeks yeah if we if we all acted from a point of compassion mm-hmm for one another and said, all right, everyone go out today, get one month of food. We will help. We will have people handing it out. Just here is one month of food. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Here's the toilet papers. Here's the feminine products. Here's everything you need and birth control because we, you're humans. Yeah. Here's one month. Yeah. Everyone quarantine for one month. We, we could cure our planet. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be that. But we won't do that. Yeah. No. And so people like me are like, and I'm not leaving my house until 2022, probably. <laughs> right. Until the vaccine, until there's multiple vaccines. Yeah. 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 So so it is that same is that same process, and you can sort of see that. And it's, and again, I mean, you know, me as the, uh, as the uh, optimistic capitalist, um, seeing this, Seeing, I am, I, I predicted, we had this conversation a couple of, what, three or four weeks ago, right? That I, that we would see this incredible response that, that for, that the United States, you do not bet against the United States when its back is against the wall. And yeah, but right now the United States is not itself. You're <laughs> the, sick at the moment. Well, yeah, but the U.S. is, is testing, is ramping up testing. Like it is figuring this out. And no, I have, actually that's not true. The, the testing rates have gone down in the past week yes up until the past week (laughs) but it had been kind of astonishing how quickly the testing had ramped up but again my feeling is that um that when we're in these situations when reality is we cannot we cannot deny the reality of the situation we do grow as a species. We do grow as a worldwide community. And I think yeah. we are going through this process. And the country that And this is going to be are... a life lesson on the importance of not isolating ourselves when yeah. you look at nations like the yeah. U.S. And the, the countries who get out the other side and start to restore their economy sh- will be able to provide a case study for the countries that are behind the, the curve to be able to decrease the pain that they have to go through. So, again, it's... Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's the countries that believe most in science that Germany flattened that curve. Yeah, and yeah. that's a nation led by a scientist. Yeah, yeah. Ireland is doing well. That's a nation yeah. led by a doctor. Yeah. The, the, the doctor, the leader of South Korea is a. I don't remember. Yeah. The, I think the and Singapore, I think it's Singapore. The leader of Singapore is like a epidemiologist or something like that. 
Yeah. <laughs> like it's just like perfectly positioned to have somebody who is focused on this kind of thing to lead their country yeah. but out the other side of it. A point for, for all of you in the United States who've been watching the numbers and watching the news, um, if you look at the number of people testing positive um, per 100 tests, that has been constant. Mm -hmm. The constant increase that you're seeing up until about a week ago was as the number of tests went up. Yeah. The decrease that is currently being seen in the number of cases being seen in the United States is a reflection of the decrease of tests available. Right. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Matthew Lear asks, join the stream late. Uh, just wondering, why are we not exploring Europa? Why does everybody seem more interested in Mars? We are exploring Europa. Just not at Europa. Yeah, not today. But I, the Europa Clipper, bless its heart, um, is, is scheduled to launch on a Space Launch Systems yeah. rocket if those ever get completed. Um, and they have a backup plan. It's just the backup plan won't get them to Europa until even the youngest scientists on the team are like, I'm ready for retirement, guys. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And yeah, Juice. Europe I forgot about Juice. Yeah. What is the Europeans mission? The Jupiter, icy moons, icy moons. But that one's not just going to Europa. No. It's, well, it's going to okay. end at Europa. So it's going to do okay. Ganymede, Callisto, and then it's going to go into orbit around Europa and, and remain there for the rest of its of its duration. Okay. So you've okay. got two missions right now gearing up to go to Europa. Okay. How many do you want? Two. That's great. Two missions that are mostly focused on Europa. That's uh, that's making it and, rain Europa style. And can we like go to Neptune next? <laughs> oh, yeah. Pl yes, please. And don't forget Venus. <sighs> yes. I, what what I hate is we are now at the age, like the physical age, this is ignoring the robot body future, where when they announce new missions, you have to look and see when they actually plan to get to the world and figure out the probability is you'll still be alive. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when you think about these, it's it's kind of stunning to think that we actually made it to Pluto at all. Yeah. A 10 year flight time, Alan Stern just pushed that, you know, through that spacecraft out into the out Pluto, Pluto, what word and and missions that need to get into orbits take much longer yes. to get to their place because they need to have um, they need to match velocities with the world they're going to. Yeah. So it's, I'm just going to keep pointing this out to people. Beppo Colombo, which is not a minor planet. There was the most amazing misidentification of that spacecraft last week. Um, it was named in 1999 and will not get to its world until I think 2025. So, sorry, which one? The the European mission to Mercury, Beppe Colombo. Oh, Beppe Colombo, yeah. 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 So um that mission is gonna be 25-ish years <laughs> yeah. from naming to orbital insertion. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. It it uh, it took a long time. All right, so my, uh, my technical support journey just wrapped up to an end. So the problem was that two of my, one of my phones in my network, my son's phone, uh, couldn't make calls on the Wi-Fi service and our cell phone service is terrible. So you pretty much can't make a phone call with your phone. Yeah. So we couldn't make the, the phone service work. Um, and so I went through technical support and out the other side, they still couldn't get the phone service work, but they also broke the phone service on my phone. Oh God. Yeah. So that's, that's this three hours and now two phones in my house don't work. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Uh, and upon that note, we've reached the end of our hour. So, um, and my technical support. Now I wait for the, the their next uh, um, their, their next support ticket to come through. Um, Pamela, what are you working on next? What can, where can people see uh, see what you're doing? 
I so over on CosmoQuest X, we on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuest X, we're working to bring out more and more content. We're doing morning coffee that is slowly morphing into community coffee in the morning where we talk about what we've done and what we dream of doing. Uh, this morning, a whole group of people shared their eclipse uh, experiences from 2017 as we look to 2024 in the future. Um, so check that out. I personally, um, I've been running a sale on, on my Etsy store um, for all of my patrons. And this weekend, I'm going to be packing up all the paintings to send out to humans. And on Sunday, I'm going to be making more art. Right on. So follow me, Star Strider, on patreon.com, on twitch.tv. Get notices when I'm getting ready to go live. Get first glimpse of everything I create. What about you, Fraser? What are you up to? So, I know you have lots of excitement going on. Yeah, so on Monday, we are going to have a interview with uh, Kevin Peter Hand. I think I have his book kicking around here somewhere. Yeah, here we go. He wrote Alien Oceans, The Search for Life in the Depths of Space. Excellent. Yeah, so we're going to be talking on on Monday on Open Space. Monday after that, just to give you all some advance warning, I've got uh, Das Valdez on the show with me. Oh, he's cool. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to be talking up from, from Kerbal Space Academy. And so we're going to be talking about um, all the incredible, like some of the greatest uh, reporting he's been doing on everything that's happening with SpaceX. So, so stay tuned for all that. Excellent. Right on. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.